Hello everyone, and in this video we're going to be looking at two problems from the Fundamentals of Physics text, uh, the Halliday and Resnick publication, and we're going to be looking at these problems from chapter 4, which is motion in two and three dimensions. In particular, we're going to be looking at problem 28 and 29 from this text. So here's problem 28. It's uh, basically talking about a stone being projected at a cliff which has a certain height. We're given the initial speed and also the angle at which it is fired above the horizontal. We know that the, stro uh, the stone strikes the cliff at position A after a time of 5.50 seconds. So what we're asked to do is find the height of the cliff, the speed of the stone just before the impact at A, and the maximum height reached above the ground. So let's have a look at how we would go about this. So the first thing to do is to write down the key information we're given in the question. And there are two key pieces of information that we're given in the question, and that is the initial velocity, which is the velocity at the launching position, and then the initial launch angle, theta naught, which is given to be 60.0 degrees. Note that both of these values are given to two significant figures, so any subsequent calculations can be given to, uh, sorry, to three significant figures, not two. Um, so any subsequent calculations can be given to 3SF as well. Uh, also note that we are given the time, that's our third piece of information, uh, and we can substitute that into our equation as well. Again, that's also given to three significant figures. So now we can use one of our equations of motion, the one that's most relevant involves the variables we know. Uh, there is another variable not listed in the problem that we actually know, and that is that the gravitational acceleration is 9.8 meters per second per second downwards, or 9.80, or 9.81. It generally doesn't matter what you use as a constant because you'll get approximately the same result, but we can use that in our calculations as well. So we have the difference in y, or some position of y, equaling the initial velocity, sine theta, because we're looking at the two um, perpendicular components of motion being, two orthogonal components of motion being separate. And in this case, we just want to look at motion in the y direction. Again, that's something we also need to pick up on is that we have a reference frame of x in the horizontal and y in the vertical. But uh, we can say that it's v naught sine theta because of the fact we're looking at the y direction motion. Uh, multiplied by t, which is the time given in the question, plus a half a t squared. So we substitute in our values, uh, 42.0 sine 60, 5.50 plus a half lots of negative 9.8, because again, we know that the gravitational acceleration is acting downwards. And uh, we can also substitute in the time there as 5.50. We can square that result and get 51.8 meters as being the height of the cliff. So again, we're just finding some position in the y direction by considering the initial velocity, the time at uh, which it strikes the cliff, and also the acceleration due to gravity. So this is why the key kinematics equations it should become second nature to you. So make sure you remember it. And it sort of makes sense that we can apply this one because again, it gives us some position in y. We don't even have to do any rearranging. So it's a logical choice. And given the fact we're given time and we're given the initial data, again, it's a really good fit for this kinematics equation. Now, b is a little bit more complex. And there are a couple of ways you can go about it. I like the way I've gone about it. I'll, I'll talk through that. But again, you can probably find quite a few different ways to actually structure your argument with this. But uh, let's consider the same equation because we're looking for some position of y, we're looking uh, initially for that position of y so we can actually get um, the speed of the stone, which uh, will become a bit more evident later on. But instead, let's change our reference frame such that v naught, our initial velocity, is actually at the peak or the apogee. So what we're really considering, if I get my uh, cursor up here, whoops. Uh, it will, if we can see, obviously, the apogee, is at the top of that uh, H there, capital H, and we can see that w the place where A actually is located is just above the height of the cliff. So what we can say is, well, we want to find delta Y in order to find the velocity, um, and that delta Y is just going to be equal to the capital H take the lower H, which is the position from the top of the apogee to the top of the cliff. 
That's really what we're doing here, and it will make a bit more sense as to why I'm doing that in a moment. But uh, something to also note is that we have a constant velocity in the x direction, which is equal to v naught sine theta, which in this case is 42.0 sine 60. Because you remember, in the absence of air resistance, the horizontal component of motion does not change because there's no acceleration occurring in the horizontal component. Remember to treat the two orthogonal components separately. But really what we're doing is we're saying delta y is obviously y max, which is the apogee, take y cliff, which is what I just explained a moment ago. But in order to get that value there, we need to work out the actual point of the apogee. Where is that apogee relative to our launch position? And then we can get that delta y distance. And uh, again, we don't actually know the time it takes for this entire parabolic motion because we're landing in a position on the cliff, we're not landing back at ground level, so we need to use something which isn't dependent on time. And uh, the, there's only really one kinematics equation that's not that dependent on time, and that is the classic one that I like to use. Uh, the final velocity in the y direction squared, take the initial velocity in the y direction squared, is equal to two lots of the acceleration in the y direction, lots of delta x, or in this case it would technically be delta y. Um, again, that's just a small notation thing. But now, instead of considering V0 being the peak, like we actually had before when we were considering B, for C, because that's essentially what we're finding now, because C is the maximum height reached above the ground, we're just going to consider V0 as launch position. So again, we do change our reference frames halfway through this question, or at least my uh, approach to this does, um, but that's no, not really an issue as long as you actually make it clear what you're actually looking at. So we substitute in our values because we know the initial y um, velocity from the launch position. It's 42 sine 60. Again, you can work that out using trigonometry. And uh, from there, we can substitute in negative 9.8 as well. And uh, we can rearrange to find the height, which should technically be delta y. That's probably better notation. But we find that to be 60, 67 0.5 meters to three significant figures. We can now continue B with this knowledge. What we do is we have Y max, which is the 67.5, and we take the 51.8 of the cliff of that, and we set that equal to a half lots of 9.8 T squared. From there, we can work out the left-hand side. That difference is 15.7, and that's equal to 4.9 T squared. From there, T squared equals 15.7 on 4.9, then we take the square root and we reject any negative solutions because in context we're looking at a positive time because we know that uh, obviously we're looking at it impacting on the cliff after the actual um, initial launch. As a result we have t equals 1.79 seconds, so the time from the apogee to the time of impact is 1.79 seconds. We then look at the velocity in the y direction, so we start with v naught y, which in this case is zero, because at the apogee the v naught y is equal to zero, we only have v naught x acting. So we end up with 9.8 times 1.79, which is the acceleration in the y direction, multiplied by time, and we find that we get to um, the magnitude of this recording is 17.5 meters per second. Again, if we define up as the positive direction, that's negative um, 17.5 meters per second, but really all we're interested in is the magnitude because we're going to actually find the velocity on impact. So we know that velocity, uh, because of the Pythagoras and the fact we can actually have the two components orthogonal to one another, uh, we know that the velocity is going to be equal to the square root of vx squared plus vy squared. From there we can substitute in our values and we find that it's 27.4 meters per second to three significant figures as the speed of the stone just before impact. Again, it asks the speed, so it's just giving a magnitude of velocity. Now, question 29. A projectile's launch speed is five times its speed at the maximum height. Find the launch angle theta naught. Really simple, this one. Uh, essentially what we're saying is that at the max point, the velocity is equal to one-fifth of theta naught. At the launch point, v, or the velocity, is equal to, um, sorry, v naught. So from here we have one-fifth v naught equals v naught cos theta because we know that only the x component of motion, the horizontal component, is acting at the apogee. So we know that one-fifth of the initial velocity is going to be equal to just the x component of motion, which remains constant. 
we can then actually bring v0 onto the other side, and we can actually cancel them out and get an expression for cos theta, because that's what we're wanting to find, theta naught. From here we find that cos theta is equal to 1 fifth. We then uh, actually bring cosine to the other side, and then using calculate technology, we find that we get 78.5 degrees to three significant figures as being the launch angle to satisfy the condition of question 29. Hopefully this video has been helpful. Um, thank you for watching. That's just some core fundamentals of physics concepts with motion in two and three dimensions.